Dr. Gerald Ozier. Let's give him a round of applause. Awesome. All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming out today. Very excited to talk to you. Uh, a lot of uh, old friends uh, that I recognize and a bunch of new ones that I hope to meet. But today, what I wanted to talk about was what Game of Thrones can teach us about cybersecurity. Now, a little bit about me before we get into it. Some of you may know me, some of you may not. Allow me to introduce myself. Um, I currently run a, a YouTube channel, but it's grown into a much larger uh, community of inclusion and support, and it's all about cybersecurity and good times called Simply Cyber. I uh, encourage you to check that out. Also, as you can see from the merch I'm wearing right now, we are actually hosting our first cybersecurity conference, which will be virtual, which means all of you can absolutely attend this Wednesday, so the timing is quite nice. I encourage you to check that out. And I teach at the Citadel, and I have a family. My two boys are right here in the front row, which is really, really cool. Thanks. And if you want to connect with me at all, simplycyber.io slash socials has like everything that I do, so you can connect with me there. Okay, so why, are, why, why did I choose this talk? By the way, first keynote ever, which is like pretty cool, like a career achievement unlock type thing. I was thinking, you know, when I, I've been in the industry 20 years, and when I think about like watching a TV show or a movie or hear a song or see something in, in life that has nothing to do with cybersecurity, I commonly think like, oh, like, you know, a PE control there would have stopped that, or, you know, like, they obviously didn't do background screening on that dude, right? So. What I was thinking, you know what would be really cool? Taking something that's so um, iconic and so immersed in our society, and some, some of the young people, unfortunately, someone brought this to my attention yesterday, some of the younger people uh, may not even know what Game of Thrones is, so I'll do my best to bring, it, bring you all up to speed. But I feel like Game of Thrones has a lot of opportunity, and there's so many parallels, which we will go through here today, between what happened in Game of Thrones and real life and cybersecurity. And the idea here is that with the power of storytelling, I can tell you like a million times over not to tell a lie, right? But if you, like all of us know the story of the little boy who cried wolf, right? Like it's, it's in bur burned in our mind. So the power of storytelling has the ability to convey lessons learned and be able to translate it and make it applicable for ourselves. Now, this talk in my mind is geared for people who are breaking into the industry, people who are new in the industry, but even people that have been working in the industry for a very long time, some of you very uh, you know, gray in the hair, right? Like I, you, you will empathize with this. You will hear these stories and be like, absolutely, Jerry, like 100%. Might even get a preach in the back row back there, okay? So that is what I'm trying to do and who I'm trying to approach. And please take some of the lessons learned I give you in this um, because there's, there's so many things that like you never, you will never, ever, ever learn in a textbook, right? You can go to a million classes, but the way that the CFO is like fidgeting in a meeting and not talking about not like undermining your agenda and not giving you budget and stuff, like you're never going to read that in a textbook. You have to learn it. So by learning from other people first, you don't have to make those, uh, mistakes. Okay. So obviously real quick. Is anyone here not seen Game of Thrones, but has a desire to see it at some point? Because I'm going to destroy every spoiler. All right, I'm sorry, boys. Okay, my, my two kids are the ones who I'm gonna ruin. Okay, that's very uh, Game of Thronesy. Okay, all right, so just as a very, very, very quick, I mean, it's like eight books, 5,000 pages, eight seasons. Like, I'm gonna compress it into 30 seconds. This is this magnificent world of um, well, not Westeros, but the world that George R. R. Martin built for Game of Thrones. Effectively, think of it as like North America, South America, Europe, and Asia, right? I mean, he kind of borrowed. Um, most of everything happens over in the North American space. Seven families, warring factions, political agendas. There's this like undead zombie nation thing going on up at the top, um, and, but they're in fighting all over the place. Sounds a lot like a business, right? So that's what that is. Now, I've broken the talk up into like categories. First, we'll be talking about different roles and how they apply. We'll look at characters in Game of Thrones, and you'll be able to immediately see uh, how they apply to different roles in industry and in business. Then we'll go through process capability. Uh, the case study is no longer here. I scrubbed it for the sake of time. And then I'm huge on career growth, career development, helping people level up their career. What's up, Joseph? So, I put a, a bunch of slides in here on, on lessons learned for career. Okay, so let's introduce our players in the Game of Thrones. 
Ned Stark, right? First guy you meet in the, in the show, wicked awesome. He's got high integrity, you know, he, he follows the rules 100%. He's, winter's coming, like that's, that's like their motto at Stark House, right? They're just like, we're always on the, um, we're always ready for whatever, right? This is like the CISO, okay? So obviously I'm super biased, right? Because I think that information security is high integrity, right? We're, we're always prepared, but he's the head dude. So he's the CISO, right? He's always worried about threats are coming, winter is coming, cyber threats, right? Like all day, every day, we're constantly like basically um, manning the wall, if you will. However, I don't know if you guys know Joseph Sullivan here. Uh, part of the problem is because of that high integrity, Joseph Sullivan was the CISO at Uber. Um, he got thrown under the bus by the executives of Uber. He was found guilty of I can't remember what the actual crime was. He, he didn't actually go to jail, but um, basically Uber got hacked and he made like a backdoor deal with the hackers, paid him off and said, don't tell anyone. And the hacker said, we won't tell anyone. Like, of course, they immediately told everyone. And uh, it was a shareholder SEC thing. So he got really, really screwed by that. But it's the same with Ned Stark. Ned Stark basically found out that, you know, Cersei was doing some weird things with her brother and you know situation was bad and he's like oh you have to tell everyone I'll let you do it like you take the high road she's like absolutely and then she basically had him framed and then and then executed right so kind of similar uh, to what happened to the our, our friend Joseph Sullivan but political intrigue um, allies turning on you CISOs need to be mindful right if you're gonna go that path it's it's a lonely road and philosophically we could talk over a coffee later of the question is, is a CISO accountable or is a CISO responsible for information security of business? If a business gets breached, is the CISO actually, should they be blamed or are they just an advisor to the business? I'm, I'm a huge advocate of the advisor to the business. I don't know if that's so I can like shun responsibility, but that's, that's what I think. Then we got our kind of um, antagonist in the story, Cersei Lannister. Uh, I already covered her little exploits with her brother. Um, but she represents everything like the master Game of Thrones player. She's ambitious. She maneuvers. She, she takes advantage of every opportunity. She sees a threat like Ned Stark, the CISO, and she has him removed basically from the board. Uh, talking about budget power play, she controls money. Remember, the, the House of Lannister was all about straight cash, right? So they could, you know, maneuver. <clears throat> they could buy people off, sell swords. <clears throat> she was a political mastermind much like our business leaders. Now, you know, political mastermind and business leaders, you may want to put a grain of salt on that because they're, uh, business leaders come in different shapes and sizes. But if you think about the business leaders in our environment, I'm talking the CEO, the CIO, who's often the CISO's boss, the CFO who holds the money which you need in order to get your projects funded, <clears throat> VCs, if they get, you know, their hands into the mix, they are very much involved in the power dynamics and sabotaging agendas. So like you might have this great idea like, oh man, like we're gonna roll out network segmentation, right? Like massive opportunity, we're gonna roll it out, risk reduction, all this, and then you either don't get funding or they're like, oh yeah, we absolutely fund it, but we're gonna have the networking team actually focus on VPNs because we're, you know, because of post-pandemic COVID, we, we need them to focus on that. So you can roll out network segmentation, but you don't get any like support from the networking team, which basically means you're not going to roll out network segmentation. Like it's a fun, it's a fun idea, but you're going to fail. So what I want to share with you is the power of partnerships. Okay. Like I'm not saying you need to like, like bring a dozen donuts to the CFO and like buddy, buddy and chum up. But what I would say is when opportunities present themselves that better serve the business leaders than they serve you, you should absolutely take advantage of those because at some point you're going to need to go to that business leader or business leaders and have them be a champion and on your side. And this is basically like the power of networking. You aren't, you, you wanna pay into that bank basically. So at the one time you need to pull out of the bank, you have an ally, you have a champion on your side who's at that business leader table and speaking for you because <laughs> you know, I, I, just as a quick aside, I don't know if you guys have ever done this, but like as a CISO or a business leader, you can literally tell the business like, guys, we have massive problems. We need to roll out MFA, for example, right? That would be tragic not to have MFA or multi-factor authentication. And they're like, yeah, like that's a lot of noise. But then you hire a consultant to come in and they're like, yeah, you really got to roll out multi-factor authentication. The business is like, yeah, yeah, you know what? That sounds right. Why, why don't we do that? So 
power partnerships, okay? All right. Small council. I'm sure some of you, some of you, uh, you know, long in the tooth folks already know where this is going. But the small council was basically like the king's right hand t table of, you know, consigliaries, right? The king's out there like, you know, dancing and shaking his butt and, and, and doing like glad handing, a, you know, shaking babies and stuff. Or not shaking babies. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Shaking hands, kissing babies. I don't know. In Game of Thrones, maybe they were shaking babies. But, but, but the small council is basically, you know, the CFO, like the, the chief finance or the master of coin, I think they called it, the master of like war, um, you know, the meister for, you know, kind of tutelage type stuff, medicine, whatever, gen pop. So this is what they do. Make key decisions. Very similar to, and I'm sure many of you already see this one, the board, right? Not all organizations have boards, right? And the board could kind of fall into business leaders. But if you are at an organization large enough to have a board, the board members are typically older, not always, but typically older. They come from a different generation. They are not very, very seldomly, right? Like, so this isn't a complete, but I would say like 99% of the time, they are not information security professionals. Oftentimes they're not IT professionals, right? So when they say things like, what are we doing about AI? Like, you're like, oh my God, like just, can you pump the brakes on this for a second? So, but, but they have the ability to set strategic direction for the business. They have the ability to allocate resources. And ultimately they are responsible for risk management for the organization. So the one key thing I would say here is when you do talk to a board, you typically get like five to 10 minutes max, maybe one or two slides max. So drilling into like how sick, like, um, like, I don't know, like Citrix bleed is, is not a good idea. Like they don't care. They're going to tune out and be on their phone. So you need high impact. You need to speak their language. You need to understand that to effectively communicate to the board or to people like that, that they care about money, right? So you need to talk in the frame of money, uh, which by the way, in this game of Thrones, like money really did drive a lot of, uh, decision-making. Quick shout out to Tyrion. This is kind of a slide I threw in. Tyrion's my favorite character in Game of Thrones. I think he's wicked cool. I didn't have a direct correlation for Tyrion, but I do, as I think about my own career and, uh, you know, like Brandon's career back there, like a lot of people are thrown in to a situation where it's like, hey, we don't have an information security office, but like you're information security now, right? So like you're a matrix network engineer and now all of a sudden you're responsible for InfoSec or some con consultant came in and said that you need to have somebody responsible for information security now because the insurance company said you have to have somebody responsible for information security. So they hire one person and you're wearing a blue hat, you're wearing a GRC vest, you're talking to the business, you're trying to do budgets and stuff, you're responding to phishing emails and people clicking on dumb stuff, right? So shout out to Tyrion because he really had very little going for him, right? I mean, he was a Lannister, which was <laughs> wicked cool, but he had like, you know, kind of a physical uh, disability. He got blamed for multiple murders, right? I don't know if you remember, he got blamed for like killing Bran, then he got framed for killing Joffrey. Like poor guy didn't do any of that. And he was a war hero and still got screwed over on that. So if you do find yourself in a situation, which you may very easily uh, be underfunded, under-resourced, underutilized. Leverage what resources you do have at your availability to the maximum, okay? Like a new shiny, like for example, a new shiny like Palo Alto firewall or Gigamon or whatever, like yeah, 200 grand, like yeah, okay, you get budget approval, you throw it in the rack and there you go. But do you have the manpower or person power to manage that system? Do you have the knowledge and expertise to even interact with that interface? Like, oh, it's a firewall, it's a firewall, it's a firewall. Yeah, but interfaces are different. The way that they work, is it, is it bringing like wildfire, like real time automatic updates? I don't know. So before you get, you know, YOLO and go into like some piece of like expensive tech, leverage the things you have, right? There's a lot of free technology out of there that you, that you can use like Security Onion or the Elk Stack, right? And then you can use that money to get uh, professional services to help you tune it up. All right, continuing with roles, uh, quick shout out to the Essos merchants. This would be like Europe on the map, if you recall. Uh, a couple side players, but very interesting. We had the Iron Bank of Bravos, right? They, they could fund things fund armies, the Golden Company, which was like basically a, a you know, a professional services company, um, right? I mean, they were, they, were, they were soldiers. And then the Faceless Men, which were like straight up assassins, right? Super BA people, all right? 
to me, these are security vendors. And I, I know that I'm giving them a lot of credit vendors. And I know there's some vendors in the room, so I'm not trashing on you, OK? But like with the Iron Bank of Bravos, if you did not pay when they said the check is due, they would literally pull your resources and then fund your adversary to crush you, OK? To me, this is a correlation, right? SaaS products are awesome, right? The cloud's going to save us. We can scale up, scale down, save money. CFOs love it. Ends up in reality costing more, but we'll talk about that another time. Well, with SaaS, they can turn the water off. They can turn the spigot off, right? And like, what are you going to do? Like, pay your bill, right? When it's, when it's on prem, it's a little harder for them to rip that out. But um, SaaS, no pay, no play, right? Um, with the uh, golden company, I said IR response staff aug, right? Our mandians, our IR people, they come in pro services, and then uh, the faceless men. I use Pegasus spyware, uh, NSO group, right? They want to be assassins. They come in, and we can have this specialized stuff. So all right, moving on. White walkers. You guys thought I was going to leave these ones out, OK? Zombies, um, they're, they're pretty cool. Uh, very shrouded in mystery. No one really knows what they come from, where they go. They kind of like uh, propagate and, 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 and multiply somehow through some type of like magic or mysticism. Um, and they're very deliberate, like, you know, the, 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 they're, even though they're like mindless zombies, they're kind of controlled and they're kind of focused and they can be deployed in a very meaningful way. To me, these are our threat actors, right? Whether they're APTs or, you know, Romanian cyber criminals or just punks like uh, Anonymous Sudan or something like that. We don't know, like when one crops up, we don't know about it until it crops up, right? We've got some threat actors that re recur, right? So like, like, you know, like Revil gets taken down and all of a sudden, you know, a new like clop ransomware pops up and there's TTPs that match, but we don't really know what's driving this uh, and where they come from. Even um, like Scattered Spider, I don't know if you've seen this one, right? Scattered Spider is the new one that hit MGM recently, MGM Resorts, but they're so arrogant. They're like clearly young, like 18 to 25, no offense to the 18 to 25 year olds in the room, but um, typically threat actors that are older don't, they don't brag as much, okay? But the, the, the threat actors, um, you could see, oh, I even added botnets because botnets multiply wildly just like um, the White Walkers did. OK, so that's the rules. Let's talk about capabilities for a hot minute. All right? The Sparrows, you remember this guy? All right? Uh, like she, he was basically the pope um, for them. The Sparrows were this religious sect. They had like very little power, very little. They were like basically kneecapped uh, at this point. But Cersei Lannister thinking that she was like super awesome, like weaponized the sparrows, gave them their faith militant back, which is basically like the Knights Templar, some type of like, you know, army, if you will, uh, religious sect. And she thought that she was going to weaponize the, that army and eliminate her adversaries. Unfortunately, she, <laughs> she was fully compromised, right? If you guys remember, um, she got brought in for, again, the exploits that she had with her brother multiple times. Um, and that was definitely not cool with the church. And they became so, so powerful that she was no longer able to control them. So what is this capability? Risk analysis. Yes, GRC. So check it out. I love GRC. That's a spoiler. OK? I love GRC. I think GRC, I'm trying to make it socially acceptable, right? Red team and blue team, you guys are so cool. But like, GRC is pretty good, OK? So let's think about this for a second. When Cersei's like, oh, yeah, you know what? I can, I can weaponize this faith militant and I can have an army for cheap, right? Because I can control them. She didn't do a risk analysis, man. She did not even think about the threat of them growing and being out of control, right? She misunderstood what motivated them. She thought, like, she basically gives money to everyone, right? Like, a lot of people are financially motivated. She pays them off. She hires sell swords. She wants someone to turn a blind eye. She pays them off. These money doesn't matter to these guys. This guy didn't even take his bath the whole time he was on the show, right? He doesn't care about money. So um, I put over permissioned access for sure. They were able to go anywhere and everywhere they wanted, uh, which, by the way, is a huge problem with cloud. Um, and in order to correct the problem, it was a massive cost, which I have a slide coming up in a minute, so I won't ruin it, although all of you probably remember how Cersei solved this particular problem, OK? All right, yes, this is, this is what happens when you don't do a risk analysis. You get drug out and, and, and yelled shame, right? All the, all the CISOs in the house who have had to do the walk of shame. All right, moving on, capabilities. The Night's Watch, right? We talked about that White Walkers up at the north. I love this one. And um, like, spoiler alert, any blue teamers in here are going to, it's going to resonate with, right? 
Now, the Night's Watch, when, the, when they join the Night's Watch, it's like for life, okay? And they have this oath that they say, and it's, it's like their pledge of allegiance, basically. But parts of it that I've extracted here for the bullets, I am the watcher on the wall, so they're, they're constantly watching, right? The horn that wakes the sleepers, okay? Like when there's a problem, they alert, okay? I'm seeing some parallels here, right? And then the shield that guards the threats of men. We are the last resort for mankind, for the organization. They are sec ops, okay? The Night's Watch is hands down, it, it's a, such a parallel to the blue team, okay? They protect the organization. And it, like it or not, this is, this is the industry, guys. This is cybersecurity. So you, constant vigilance is like paramount, right? You, like I, I know we take time off and we spend time with family, but like if, if the phone buzzes, right? I mean, this is why some people don't wanna do blue team operations because Threat actors don't care if it's Christmas Eve. Threat actors prefer to attack on long weekends, 4th of July and stuff, because it's a softer target, right? SecOps does triage, alert, and respond, of course, and then threats are always evolving. The key difference, though, I want to point out, says to not to deter some of the younger people in the audience, like my boys, from going into SecOps. The Night's Watch, you were never allowed to leave, okay? Like, once you're in, you're in for life, uh, unless you find a loophole like John did and get killed and then resurrected. But... Um, <laughs> sec ops, you're allowed to leave, okay? You can punch out. In fact, it, for mental health, it's actually encouraged you punch out and take a break, okay? Uh, pledging your life is optional. You do not have to die in the sock, all right? That's okay. And one of the things that they say in their chant or whatever is that we'll, we'll take no family, we'll take no money, we'll take no glory. Okay, if you take down a threat actor and you save the organization from ransomware or you like defang something and you do something cool, you absolutely should take take a lot of glory you should be you should do a victory lap around the room and you should definitely like at, you know tell the CISO that like don't forget about this when it's time for uh, pay raises buddy right so get the glory all right Viserion if you guys remember Viserion he was you know he was the weakest and kind of the the, the smallest of all the dragons uh, Daenerys Targaryen had three dragons right Viserion was the smaller one but he was still the dragon right that's still super cool uh, he was wicked powerful. He could, you know, he could fly, obviously he could breathe fire on command, which was wicked good. He was in an advantageous weapon system. I'll cover this a little bit more later, but like, if you have a dragon, you can pretty much dictate what's going to happen next, right? Like you are in command. You have an advantageous weapon system. Unfortunately, um, the zombie nation there, they threw like an ice bolt through his chest somehow and uh, took him down and then resurrected him as a zombie. So they were able to get him. So they weaponize them. And we see this all the time with threat actors taking things that are like we are using as defenders and as IT infrastructure to deliver services and risk reduction to our organization. And they weaponize it. PowerShell famously, right? Empire, the post-exploitation framework is all in PowerShell. Cobalt Strike is a popular one for threat actors, even though it's a legitimate commercial product. Threat actors can set up shell companies and get instances and stuff like that. I do want to give a shout out because I didn't know about this. Um, again, I'm a GRC guy, so you know you got you, you blue teamers keep cool stuff away from us uh, and red teamers. But uh, LOL BAS dash project that's living off the land binary application scripts dash project. And this website just is a list of things that are native to Windows systems and Linux systems that you can use to do privilege escalation, exploitation, persistence, uh, C2 uh, stuff like that. So this is like like Obviously, go to simplycyber.io slash socials to connect with me, but if you take one thing, uh, that website is incredibly valuable if you did not know about it already. The Unsullied, all right? You guys remember this? This was like the, the army that, like, I think the guy, like, cut himself, like, on command. Like, th these guys are loyal to, uh, unbelievably loyal. Like, they don't even have their own thoughts, right? Uh, the story writers did do a little bit with this guy where he started to get, like, a little romantic and having his independent thoughts and stuff, but they're highly effective unwavering vigilance and their training was renowned it, it like they trained all the time consistent training as a capability is so valuable and I, I just want to pause for a minute because I personally believe that information security awareness training is one of the three most like in, in the realm of like risk reduction to an organization right like high high value lo low cost Information security awareness, multi-factor authentication, and security operations, like an MDR or IR, something like that, are the three, 
if I go into an organization before I even do a risk assessment, before I see what the hell's going sorry, Kennedy, before I, before I see what's going on, like that's, that's what I do first. Those three things have to be in place. And so when we think about the once a year PowerPoint, right, like that's not information security awareness. That's actually kind of like sand in my shorts. Like it's annoying, it's irritating, no one wants it. Uh, there are ways to do it, but if we do end user awareness and focus security training, like all of like us as practitioners going and learning how to use Splunk or going to a training to do advanced detection engineering and stuff like that, like leveling up ourselves, that is gonna make us much more effective as a capability. Also, don't sleep on tabletop exercises. With ransomware the way it is, you absolutely should be doing ransomware tabletop exercises with your business, okay? Weapon systems advantages, okay? So this is Daenerys. And most of us think of Daenerys Targaryen um, in, in scope of the, um, the dragons she had because they were so, so powerful. But I want to call your attention to these three particular instances. The Sack of Astapor. This is where she buys the Unsullied from the, um, from the, the people who train the Unsullied, whatever they're called, the Astaporians, i sure, right? So they said, we'll sell you the Unsullied, but it'll cost you one dragon. And she's like, ah, these are my babies. And they're like, well, that's the cost, bro. And she's like, ah, all right. So she immediately does the transaction. The dragon goes on the other side. She immediately orders the Unsullied to kill all of them. And then she takes her dragon back, right? That is an unbelievably powerful weapon system that she had. She had an army and she immediately ex uh, executed on it. The Battle of Marine. This is where she uses her three dragons to just annihilate a fleet, like an entire navy ev eviscerated instantly. Super powerful weapon system. She didn't have the numbers, she didn't have the brawn, and she, she took them out in like a minute. And then finally, the loot train attack. She had access to the Dothraki, which were basically like uh, horse riding uh, Mongolians, effectively, right? And they were, this, this group was coming back from raiding uh, Dorne, and she basically just took them out. Very similar to what the United States did in Iraq way back in the day on that, that long train ride, uh, if you guys know what I'm talking about. But anyways, the, the point is, she had multiple weapon systems which gave her unbelievable advantages in uh, these conflicts. So we can use next-gen tooling in our instances, right? Soar and AI, again, I put this bullet here not to make you guys chuckle or smile to yourself, but to, to take a moment and really like face these head on. If you can use AI and or security orchestration, automation and remediation in effective ways, it's a force multiplier for your organization, right? You're only gonna get so many FTEs at your business, right? Unless you're an organization that has 85 FTEs for 1,500 employees somehow, which happens, I guess. But m many of us are the Tyrians, right? Many of us are the one person shops, the two person shops. You, you're trying to deal with like, you know, the best you can. So using those orchestrations in AI allows you to uh, level it up. Also, just a quick shout out, I, I did some work with Raymond James recently and they actually patented this thing called the MOAD. It's the mother of all decoys. And I wanna give a shout out on it because it's really interesting. If they find a threat actor in their environment, Raymond James is a financial management company. So of course, like lots of money going in there. If they find a threat actor in their environment, they can deploy this MOAD and it shuns the threat actor into that it, it's basically a honey network, but it is a massive honey network with tons of endpoints, tons of real traffic going on, people logging in at 9 a.m., logging out at 5 p.m., going to lunch, their computer's idle, and they basically monitor what the threat actor's doing, and the, the threat actor's just burning all their, all their infrastructure, all their IOCs, all their everything. It, it's really, really interesting. That's a, an example of a next-gen tool. You're not just sitting there like combing through Exchange Online quarantine emails and, and like that's what you're doing for cyber risk reduction. Also don't sleep on fundamentals guys. I know it's really cool and sexy to have SOAR, but like maybe multi-factor authentication, right? Maybe long passwords. All right, we got Varys, the master of whispers. Sometimes people find this guy a crowd favorite. I kind of liked him, he grew on me over the years. But one of his key things that he had was this extensive spy network, right? I don't know if you guys remember, he had like little kids running around, he had high-end political figures. Everybody was like kind of feeding into him what was going on. And he used that information, he took it, he analyzed it, and then he either gave it to certain people or he withheld it from certain people in order to achieve his ends, his means, drive his mission, right? I mean, I don't know, but that's all day long, that's threat intel, right? We get tons and tons of raw data coming in 
we have as analysts, we analyze it, we figure out, is this valuable? Can we attribute it? Can we integrate it with other knowledge? And then what can we do with it to help the business achieve risk reduction? I, I, I love it, I love it. Like this guy, Threat Intel all day long, probably, you know, I know he was a eunuch, but like probably former military, worked in, you know, like NSA kind of thing, and then, you know, went, 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 went on his own, right? I love it. All right, so let's talk about some processes now, right? This one, I, like, I almost wanted to put this slide first because this is the one thing about Game of Thrones that absolutely irritated the Jesus out of me, okay? The cat's paw dagger, you guys recognize this? This, this dagger comes up multiple times throughout the show. I think Arya's the one, spoiler alert, boys. It's the one Arya uses to end the Night King, but it was first seen in like the second episode of the first season because Cersei and Jamie are, are doing things that they shouldn't be doing together. Bran Stark, the youngest, sees what's happening. Jamie pushes him out a window trying to kill him. He doesn't die. So he needs to be eliminated. So an assassin breaks in with the cat's paw dagger and tries to, to assassinate Bran. The mum gets involved and the assassin runs away, right? Leaves the cat's paw dagger. Key evidence used in the trial of Tyrion Lannister for who, who did this, right? So here's, before I flip the slide, here's what really annoys me about this. They had the weapon, they had the motive, they had everything, right? And they blame it on Tyrion, and he goes to the Eyrie for like a trial, and he does a trial by combat, which Bronn gets involved in all this other stuff, but they just abandon that storyline. Like, the entire thing of evidence that they hinge the entire case on is that uh, Peter Baelish, right, the little finger, he's like, oh, Tyrion won that dagger from me in a poker game. And they're like, oh, there you go, that's it. Like, Tyrion did it. Like, that one piece of evidence. The problem is, and we see this all the time, unfortunately, and some of us uh, who have worked together in the past, it's, it's, it's actually an inside joke that we talk about. If you don't do root cause analysis on big incidents, big issues, you can lead to misattributing what happened, how it happened, how it initially occurred. You cannot button the holes of the problem and have it happen again. The city of Dallas, a month ago, got ransomware. The city of Dallas got attempted ransomware. They inter intervened, but they started getting hit again last week. Okay? They got hit, and they just responded and fixed the problem and recovered, and then kept going, and then they got hit again, right? You, it's, it's, it's incredibly important, not always, like a phishing email, you, like forget about it, you're not even gonna do it. Like somebody clicks and downloads something stupid and runs it on their workstation. No, you don't, you're not doing root cause analysis on that. You're not like breaking out the war room. But when there's a massive incident, you like, like this cat's paw dagger assassination attempt, you need to do root cause analysis. You need to figure out how it happened, who's it attributed to, what was their motivation, is it gonna happen again, how can we prevent it, who was involved, how deep did the compromise go? And it's hard. That's the thing, guys. Like, that is work. That's why we're employed. It's hard work. And it's easy to be like, that, ah, because no one's gonna be able to question you. If you're like, no, nah, it's fine, it was Russia. Like, no one, no, like, no one in the business knows if you're telling the truth or not, that's why they hired you. And if you don't, if you don't do it, um, you, you're, you're really flirting with fire. Now we got Sam, Sam Tarley. He was at um, he was at um, the, the 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 Night's Watch up up north, and then he got you know basically again. It's forever unless you're Sam Tarley, who did not die and get resurrected. He just got to go down to Old Town. I think they were training him up to be a meister to go back to the Night's Watch. Anyways, long story short, while he's there at the library down at the Citadel, no, no, uh, no relation to the, our Citadel, military college, he goes through all this documentation. He finds out that there's a huge cache of Dragonglass, which is like the only thing that can kill the threat actors, the White Walkers, uh, underneath Dragonstone. He figures out that this like incurable disease, Grayscale, has a cure, which they use later in the show. All because it was documented, right? We don't document for crap in our industry, guys. Like, especially uh, with all due respect to the IT people too, like people don't really document, right? And documentation, if you get too granular, it doesn't port well. And people are like, why are we wasting time documenting? Get out of my way. But the thing is, documentation has massive value for scaling up your skill, your team, your organization. And I know it sounds trivial, but the first time you reach into some documentation and it helps you quickly, that's where it becomes really powerful. And by the way, with AI, like ChatGPT and stuff, I suspect 
within the next mm, 12 to 18 months, you're gonna be able to deploy like the type of chat GPT stuff internally to your organization. So instead of like, you know, opening documents, control F, looking for stuff, you can literally just ask like, what's the process for responding to a fish? And it'll lay out your SOP, like your organization's SOP, right? So that's powerful. Again, going back to next gen tooling. Tactically, IOC, share it with ISACs, uh, which is Information Sharing Analysis Centers. Operationally, documented in an SOP or wiki. I've seen successful wiki usage. The problem is documentation takes time. It doesn't feel like you're moving anything forward. But I'm telling you, it's helping the next person and it helps with process improvement. Many really successful organizations, if you look at why they became successful and why they're so good at what they do, they have documentation, which means they have standard procedures, which means they have expected outcomes. Instead of just some guy who's been there 25 years, who's just like, move, like I can do it. And like, that, that doesn't help anyone, okay? <laughs> then we got Jon Snow. Now, this might seem a little peculiar, because I'm talking about capabilities and processes here. And I'm, now I'm bringing up old John here, but hear me out. Again, <laughs> certain things piss me off. This one's gonna, this one is a button, okay? So we got Jon Snow, he gets introduced in. He's basically a, a, a bastard child. His dad is Ned Stark, but his mom is just somebody he met who's not Ned Stark's wife, okay? So he's an illegitimate Stark. He grows up as like kind of a, a, you know, a kid who's not really part of the family, but he's part of the family. The mom regularly is prejudiced against him. He gets the small chicken wing, right? He gets the small pork chop at dinner time. all right? He has no claim to Winterfell. But then we find out, because of documentation, thank you, uh, Samwell Tarly, he's actually a Targaryen, okay? There was like some annulment stuff. The dad was hiding it, right? He's royal, awesome. He can ride dragons now, which is super BA. The name of the movie or the book or the series is Song of Fire and Ice. We got Daenerys, who's like fire, and him, he's Jon Snow, right? He's ice, like, oh, this, the whole thing's coming together. It's so brilliant. George R.R. R. Martin, what a ride. And uh, John, whatever, okay? <laughs> so John and Danny ro uh, rock the boat, right? I was trying to find a way to put this so my kids would. <laughs> okay, so like he, Daenerys, Daenerys, uh, Daenerys Targaryen is John's aunt, okay? But they get together and have so much love that they share some experiences, okay? You might think, well, this is this is classic, right? The Targaryens wed inter inter. Sisters married brothers, right? So like, oh, they're gonna have a baby and that's gonna be the king, right? Cool. He's got a claim, a better claim to the Iron Throne. Like it or not, I know in 2023 we're much more like progressive and enlightened, but back then th this was a patriarchal world. So you could be like 50th down the line, but if the 49 above you are females, you've got the claim to the throne. So he had a stronger claim to be king than Daenerys had to be queen, even though she'd done, you know, eight seasons of butt kicking, right? He's got Targaryen blood, which means maybe he could walk through a fire. Wicked cool. What, what are they gonna do? What are the producers gonna do with this amazing, complex, intricate storyline that's paying dividends? Nothing, they don't do anything. They do nothing with it, they build it up, and then Daenerys just like loses her mind. I think Jon kills her, and then like, they just like ride off in the sunset. It's so stupid, it's, it's, this is, this kills me. It's like, why did you, why did you tease me, man? Ugh. Abandoned projects. Do you, okay, so I have seen this so many times and we are so, we are so lean for time and money and resources in cybersecurity that when you decide to move forward on something, you have to see it through. And I have seen so many abandoned projects and if you don't, if you've never experienced this, get ready. And if you have, you're probably like itching yourself from like PTSD right now. Okay. You have, the, everybody's got this cool idea. We should totally do this. All right. Let's, let's roll out security onion. Perfect example. Cause this actually happened. Some of the people in the room know what I'm talking about. We're going to roll out security onion. Yes. Like kick in the door, kick off meeting, bring it in, bring networking in security operations. We're telling the, the, the CIO about it. We're going to revolutionize what's going on here. Then there's like no oversight. No one's asking for updates. No one's being held accountable. There's no PM. This is why I say sec tech de deployment. And then you roll it out, you install it. There's no tuning. There's no integration. No one's looking at it. And it just, it just like lists off in, into the distance and no one sees it again. And by the way, to add insult to injury, now you've got a server stood up running software on your network that has privileged access, that is not being maintained, that people forgot about, 
And, and the, the whole thing of it was a waste of time. And it actually introduced additional risk to your organization. It's boneheaded. And it's so annoying to me. Like, if you ever get yourself in a position where they're going to kick off a project, like, ask the questions like, who's running this? Who, like, what are the, what's the cadence for maintaining things, right? I've seen multiple vulnerability management projects uh, fail for this way because, you, you know, like, IT needs to be responsible for this, or this application order needs to be responsible for this, and then they, they just stop showing up to the meetings. And you're like, okay, all right. Finally, the SEPTA Baylor, okay? Remember I told you earlier the sparrows, the religious uh, faction, and how money couldn't drive them? Well, Cersei has to take care of them. And what she ends up doing is to deal with them is basically there's a huge amount of like super explosive, think like, you know, kerosene or dynamite or whatever underneath the sep, which by the way is like very pl convenient plot device. But anyways, she detonates it. It's a huge, I mean, catastrophic failure. It blows up this church and really eliminates all the risks that Cersei had. How not to do a disaster recovery. Okay, let's just point it out really quickly. Okay, again, convenient plot points. Thank you, um, authors. All material assets were in here. Every important person, every important capability, every important, like the church building itself was an important element, right? In one swift stroke, she eliminated. There's a reason the president and the vice president of the United States do not fly together. It's, it's, it's business continuity. It's disaster recovery 101. President goes down, VPs immediately raise to the president, and we're off and running. This, with all due respect, they did no risk assessment. Again, just to kind of get into GRC for a hot minute, right? Like, for a minute, if you just thought about it and said, like, is there any risk to all of us being in this room right now? Right? Zero contingency plan. Basically, when she nuked this, like, the, the sparrows just disappeared from the story altogether. So don't do d DR like this, okay? All right, let's talk about career for a minute, and, then, and this will be rounding out the talk. Um, they say in the show, the night is dark and full of terrors. I'm saying our cyber careers are dark and full of terrors, but we, we, we march forward into it very happily, oddly enough. So this is Sansa Stark, and I actually think of all the characters in Game of Thrones, she's the one who her story arc exhibits a cyber career more than anything. This is her naive... You know, she's like at like a jousting event. She's ah, like Hercules, right? And then here's her like the next day. She's like queen of the north, battle hardened. Look at this. This woman, you're like, oh, going to have to ask Sansa for his budget. Oh, <laughs> not good. Okay. So this is her on day one. And this is day 90 in InfoSec, right? <laughs> But, but it, it really is a case study. I say CISO case study because she, she becomes the queen bee. But she starts off completely naive to the world. N no idea what's going on. Uh, trusting people she shouldn't, saying things she shouldn't. And by the end, through all the experiences, and she suffers greatly, right? If you know her story, it's tragic. I mean, she gets married off like four different times. Um, she, she gets taken advantage of. But because of learning from her past, which all of us should, um, she becomes Queen of the North and is very, very good at the Game of Thrones by the end of the thing. So some, some career things, right? We got the Hound and Sansa. Now, their relationship was hostile. He was basically taking her and trying to bring her back uh, to King's Landing. But they have shared experiences. And one of the things around the complex morality of it is, you know, Sansa's like, oh, you're a knight. You're chivalrous, right? And, like, that's when she was this person. Like, oh, knights are really cool, they do the right thing. And the hound is like, no, they're actually cruel. Um, they're powerful, so they can just like smack people around if they want. They take what they want, they don't care. They're monsters, right? So, he, uh, so what I'm suggesting is giving mentorship. He didn't have to, but he saw, he saw things of himself in Sansa, and he gave mentorship. He guided her, and I wanted to point out, he's not the typical mentor. When you think of mentorship, right, it's not like he was, you know, uh, a, a daughter of a royal family, right? He was, he was uh, kind of a rough, rugged knight guy, and, but he was still able to give mentorship. So when you are giving mentorship to someone, right, don't, don't think that you have to have, it's, you're, like, it's not like you are where they want to be. You might have aspects of who you are that can help them, but you don't have to think like, oh, I can't help this person because they're not going to grow up to be a, a CISO or something like that, right? So there is, and you can help build confidence in that person. Continuing Sansa's tracks around mentorship, 
we have Elena Tyrell. Now, Elena Tyrell, she was the queen of thorns. She kind of bucked the system. Again, it was very much patriarchy down there, but she was like the queen of her situation, and she knew how to play the Game of Thrones quite well. So she recognized Sansa and, you know, her situation, how na naive she was. And this was actually one of the first situations where Sansa begins to get true uh, development and adjustment into understanding what is going on. So Sansa's taking the mentorship at this point. So what I, I wanted to give both sides of this coin, if you are getting mentorship, if you're getting help from someone, rather at scale, right, or individual one-on-one -on -one situations, you got to remember, like, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of like a living bond, like the mentorship thing, right? And not to make it goofy or, or romantic or anything like that, but like, if you are a, 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 like rude or in, ill receptive, right? Like, oh, like, hey, like, oh, check it out. I want to be a sock analyst. What do I do? Thank you. I want to be a sock analyst. What do I do? Oh, do this lab. Okay, do this lab. Okay, cool. And then like we meet in two weeks. I'm like, hey, how's, what, what, what problems did you have with the lab? It's like, I didn't do it. It's like, like, I'm not interested in helping you because you're not interested in helping yourself. I'm putting into this mentorship and you're not taking out of it. And it's not fair. It's, it's not respectful. All right. So just a word to the wise. It's easy to commit to something and get super excited. Again, going back to the abandoned projects where you like amped up to kick off the project. Mentorship is one of those projects too, right? You're developing yourself, but you have to be committed to seeing the project through. Okay, we got Cersei and Sansa. Again, just to round all this out, Cersei uh, is basically her mother-in-law at this point. They live in King's Landing. Cersei, the best at the Game of Thrones altogether, weaponizes and takes advantage. She tells uh, Sansa, like, hey, come up to the Red Keep, stay with me during this war. I'll protect you. And in reality, she's, like, holding her basically as, like, a ward so she can have, like, uh, an insurance clause if she needs to get out. So she lies she manipulates, she undermines Sansa a lot. And Sansa will be like, I think we should do this. And she's like, that's the stupidest idea ever, even though it was like a good idea. And the whole idea behind that is to control. So what I want to tell you is avoid toxicity. Now in our industry, if you've been around a while, it used to be way worse, way worse. It's gotten so much better. There's a lot of people out in the community right now who are trying to change how to help people. But I want you to know, if you are at work or you are in a Discord server or something like that, and someone's being a jerk, you, like, you don't have to deal with that. either. You, and, and if they're piling on you, leave the Discord server. It's not you. There's so many supportive, inclusive communities to get access to and to work with. You don't need to deal with it. I've worked at organizations before where there were people in IT who were kind of weird and toxic. And, you know, I, I didn't want to quit my job, but I was able to basically compartmentalize and, and, and carve them off. Because toxicity will eat away at you and it will F you up. And, and it really isn't something that you need to deal with, like not living rent free in your head, okay? So this is more of a mental health thing, but I want you to know. Um, all right, so you know nothing Jon Snow was something that Egret said. Egret was a wildling thing, right? Uh, Jon grows up in this like sheltered life, just like kicking butt, eating good food, got a, like a, a cool mink on all the time so he's not cold, right? That's fine, that's fine. But he did know some things, right? When he went into the north, right? So he basically gets kicked out of Winterfell. He decides to join the Night's Watch. And then he goes north of the wall and he's like fighting zombies and he's fighting wildlings and everything. He's getting real practical skills, okay? This is not, I have a PhD, right? Like I went to higher ed and went the whole gambit, right? So I'm not crapping on higher ed and the value of uh, continuing education. But in our world right now, practical skills, hands-on experience, actually sitting at the keyboard, actually tuning things, dealing with threat actors, dealing with end users, that is incredibly valuable. And it should be used to complement the education that you are getting. If you are in college right now and you're listening to this and all you're doing is going to classes, you are going to be hard pressed when you graduate to deliver value to an organization, okay? And it's, 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 it's the reality of, of the industry. Okay, there's no easy button, but there is ample opportunity. There's an A load of opportunity to get practical hands on skills, so don't sleep on it. Okay, we got Jamie. I want to just tell you this really quickly. Super awesome night, right? He's got some questionable things. He does recover his character arc at near the end of the show, but whatever. That's not the point here. He's like a really good uh, sword guy. He gets his hand cut off like season six or something like that, and they replace it with a gold hand. Whatever. The thing is, he can't use it anymore. So he has to become left-handed, and he sucks at left-handed fighting. But 
the point I want to point out is he actually finds other ways to deliver value to his organization. He becomes a battle strategist. He's been in a million battles. He can, he can general it, right, with one hand. He talks to the king council. He does diplomacy. He goes as an envoy to other places. You can pivot within cyber. It's actually quite easy, right? Say you're a red teamer and you're just getting burnt out. You hate writing reports. Do you know what? SOC analysts that do detection, like really detection engineers, they are awesome if they come from the red team pen testing side because they know exactly how a threat actor is going to pivot and move around the organization. Don't, if you're getting burnt out or you're getting sour on what you're doing, within the industry, you can pivot around. Don't think just because like you're an Azure security architect doesn't mean you can't become a vulnerability management analyst or, or whatever you want, right? It's, it, there's a lot. Find your passion. Please, it, it, passion is so, so important because we, we put a lot of ourselves into the industry, into the work. It's hard work. All right, we got the 998th Lord Commander. This one, if you remember, the, like Lord Mormont, he, uh, he, he, Lord Commander Mormont, he's leading the Night's Watch. Everything's cool up there. He dies, and then there becomes like a, like a runoff election to, to hire the new one. Jon Snow gets hired, okay? He wins a, a nail-biter election. There's different factions going on. But why I put this up here is because John wasn't the most seasoned, the longest tenured, anything like that. But he had relationships. He worked as a steward. He helped build some stuff. He worked as a warrior, obviously north of the wall. He did all these things. Networking within our industry is so valuable. You literally could be the valedictorian of your graduating class and like, you're amazing. Like, oh, you're so amazing. Somebody who graduated middle of the class they can do the same work that you can do, right? Maybe you can do it fancier or cooler or whatever, but middle of the, if they spent, instead of doing all that extra studying, if they spent that time going to conferences, introducing themselves, joining communities, delivering value, they're gonna get the job because I've hired people, okay? This is a reality and some of you have hired people, I know will know this and empathize. I've hired people. Here's the thing, I've got a need. I need someone to do GRC work, right? I have a need. What I don't want is spending three months or four months going through resumes, going through HR, going through all this nonsense, when I know that you can do the work. I will call you and be like, hey, are you looking for work? Because to me, time is valuable and I need my GRC work done now. I don't need it three months from now. And fair or not fair, that's how the world works. So networking is absolutely critical. And there's a million ways to do it. I gave a talk at Wild West Hacking Fest a few weeks ago with James McQuiggan, actually, on how to do this in many different ways. So I encourage you to check that out if you're looking. Final slides here. The Dooms of Valeria, right? This is going back a little bit, pre-Game of Thrones fire and ice. But basically, this was like the greatest civilization in the world. This is where all the dragon riders are flying around. The Targaryens were actually kind of like not even a powerful faction, but they had a vision that this place was going to explode. So a year before, they move out, all right? This is kind of my takeaways here. Be the CEO of you, right? Like right now we're kind of in a recession. Inflations are high, mortgage rates are high. All the, uh, the industry or our, our environment is kind of tough right now, all right? You could be like, oh, I work for this company. It's a family. We have the greatest Christmas parties, whatever. They'll lay you off in a hot minute, right? It's not personal. Ex labor expenses is the highest line item on a balance sheet, period, end of story. And if they can reduce 10% workforce and tell the other 90% to absorb that work, they will because the business didn't just lose any capability, but they did shave off 10% of salary, all right? So what's that mean for you? Like, oh shit, what am I gonna do now? Here's the thing, always be networking, always be scaling up. Don't, don't be sniffing around looking for work all the time. Contribute, deliver value, going back to this, networking. When you need it, it'll be there. Just as a personal story, and again, everybody's mileage may vary. On November 1st last year, the CEO of my company called me on the phone. He asked me, how long can you go without a paycheck? Okay, I said, I'm not gonna go without a paycheck. What are you talking about? And he said, hey, we're having a cash flow issue. We got some invoices that are gonna come in, but I just need you to go without a paycheck for a while. I said, okay, I hung up. I have a side business. Again, your mileage may vary, your, your experiences will be different. I called up one of my clients and I said, do you want me to work for you full time? He said, yeah, what, what are the terms? I, I told him the same arrangement I had with my current employer. He said, done. I hung up, I called my CEO back, I said I quit. And he's like, Jesus, that was faster than I thought. And I said, well, what do, you, what do you want me to do, bro? Like, you just told me you're not paying me anymore. As far as I'm concerned, you just laid me off. And he's like, oh. But again, that's years of me doing networking, years of me putting in the time and delivering to 
a community and a network. Okay, so your mileage may vary, but I'm telling you, that's a case study of how it can be done. I was unemployed for about 20 minutes. Okay? All right, your story's unfinished, right? Everything, like, guys, where you are now and where you're going to be, you control it. You can invest, you can pivot, you can network, you can do everything, okay? Don't think you're shoehorned into something because you're, you're good at it, you're a specialist at it. In fact, I'd even argue, sometimes you get screwed for promotions because they're like, oh, we can't move, we can't move Brandon out of here because then who's going to do AD, right? So don't, don't, like, control your own destiny. That's, like, the, the most important thing I can share with you, okay? Find your passion. All right. Obviously, um, we're a couple minutes out. I, if you want to connect with me, follow-up questions, whatever, this is the best URL to connect with me. It's got a list of all the things that I'm doing, including this conference. I hope you got value out of this. I hope you found it mildly entertaining. Uh, I appreciate all of your time today, especially my boys for being polite and respectful. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'll, I'll happy to answer them. Otherwise, thank you for your time. Any, any questions real quick? Okay, I'll see you guys in the hallway, thank you.